that announcement as well. As well, welcome to week nine, and this is actually our final week of this sermon series. So, welcome to week nine of our learning to live a new life in Christ. I hope in these last, it's actually been uh, eleven weeks, but no one's really counting, right? Uh, because uh, there was an Ascension Sunday we didn't count, and there was Pentecost Sunday which we didn't count. So, it's actually been eleven if you're an accountant, but it's nine if you do slides. So. Welcome uh, to this last Sunday. I hope through all these weeks you are learning to value the new life in Christ that that you've been gifted by him. And I hope that you're learning to live it to the fullest or more fully at least in a way that would glorify and honor him in every way. So we've been exploring the depths of what that new life is and how it looks. And so uh, we're doing that again today. And this new life was gifted to us, as John said, through the saving work of Jesus Christ. And there is a party in heaven when when we give our lives to the Lord and when we allow that new life to come into us. And it's through the resurrection of Christ as well that, that he was raised to life evermore. It's because he was raised that we too can have eternal life. And we are looking forward to that, not only in the future, but we can live that out now as we learn to live this new life in Christ. It's Jesus' work that allows us to fulfill God's call in our life to be holy as he is holy. And you'll remember that's our theme for the entire year. Lord, how do we do that? It's only through his work and it's only through that new life that he gives us that we can truly fulfill that call to be holy as he is holy. We can't do that unless we become believers in Jesus Christ first, unless we allow that new life to infill us. But when we allow that to happen, new things happen to us all over and over again. And now that we've been given that new life in Christ, we need to learn to live it in the way that God intends it to be lived. We want to do that to the fullest extent. And our theme verse for this series has been 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. And it says this, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. We've acknowledged again and again throughout this entire series that learning to live our new life in Christ is a process. And it takes time. And it takes some life adjustments uh, to each of our lives personally that we might begin to live fully and completely for him. And we are realizing that it's as the Holy Spirit leads us through this process of adjustments in our lives that we are fulfilling the goal of living in complete holiness. It takes time. It takes uh, some adjustments in a lot of different areas, and we've been covering those. So as we learn to live our new life in Christ, we are also learning that as we do that, we are expressing our love for God in more ways than we ever imagined. We learn to express our love for God in our, our, our mouth, by the way we talk, by what we listen to, by what we see, by where we go, by what we do with our hands, where we go with our feet. We are learning that all of those are expressions of our love for God in response to what he has done for us. And as we do that, we bring glory and honor to him, and we bring more and more blessings to ourselves as we use more and more of our lives to bring glory and honor to him. What an amazing new life he has given us. For today, we're going to be looking at the adjustment that must be made to our body if we're going to live this new life in Christ. There are adjustments that we have to make to the way that we use our bodies. And specifically, we're going to be focusing in today on how we use our body to honor God through our sexual behavior. Now, I know that this is a topic that makes people uncomfortable. I'm not even going to make you raise your hand. I know you're uncomfortable already, right? Um, But really, uh, sexual behavior is something that we have to deal with no matter our age or stage in life. It is something that we will deal with and will continue to deal with no matter our age and stage. And you need to know that the world doesn't blush to loudly and boldly proclaim their utterly destructive view of sexual behavior. They don't back off on it at all. If not, if anything, they continue to ramp up their immoral push of what they call sexual behavior. And the sinful use of our bodies is portrayed as acceptable and normal on TV, in movies, in books, in print media, in songs of every genre, on the news, and all over the internet in more ways than I have time to list. The world pushes and pushes 
their view of sexual, um, uh, uh, of sexual behavior, and it is devastating and destructive. We are all exposed to those messages and the negative influences over and over again in increasing ways. So let's not be shy about hearing what God has to say about our bodies and our sexual behavior. Because both of those he created. He created our bodies and he created every desire that we have. And you need to know that. Scripture is full of information about how we use our bodies because God is the one who made them. And he's the one that gifted them to us to use to fulfill the desires that he has given us. If you need to be reminded today of who created you, let me challenge you this week. Open your Bible to the front and read the first two chapters, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And you'll read all about who made you and who gifted you life. In Psalms, we're going we're gonna to skip to Psalms 139 today. In Psalms, David proclaims that God created our bodies and uh, that, that God created our bodies with skillful intention. And he has a plan for our lives, which includes how we uh, use our bodies that he created. So listen to what David says in Psalms 139, 13 through 16. He says this, You made all my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the darkness of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. How amazing and wonderful it is to be gifted a body, right? And we don't, we don't really appreciate that when we're young, but the older you get, how many of you appreciate the body that you had a little bit more? And you wish, like, I wish I kind of had that other body, the, the younger body back, right? You don't appreciate your knees until you get older. You don't appreciate your joints and all those things. But we realize as we get older that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we've been put together specifically for specific purposes. And it is a gift from God that we have our bodies. And we've been talking about uh, many of our body parts that, that were each given to us to bring glory and honor to God. And in this sermon series, we've already talked about our hearts in our mind, our eyes, and our ears, in our mouths, in our hands, in our feet. And all of those have been gifted to us to use to bring glory and honor to God. God is very clear with us that there is a right way and a wrong way to use our bodies and to fulfill the, de and to fulfill the desires that he has given us. Let me break it down for you because it's real simple. The right way to use our bodies is to fulfill the desires in obedience to the way God instructed us to use them, or the way that God instructed us to do it. That's the right way to use our bodies. Let me give you a little secret. When we obey God, we find blessings and satisfaction beyond anything you could ever imagine when you use your body as God designed it to be, and you use your body to the fullest to bring glory and honor to him, there is, there is blessings and satisfaction in that. The flip side is this. There's a wrong way to use your body to fulfill your desires, and that's when you do it however you want to do it, thus disobeying God's instructions. And you need to know equally well this. Disobedience to God always brings brokenness and curses into our lives beyond anything we, that we could ever imagine. Just as there is great blessings for using your body to, to glorify God, there is great brokenness and there are great curses when we don't use our body as God gifted us to use them. And we will bear the consequences either positively or negatively by the way that we choose to use our bodies. So it's not a light subject at all. It's a huge, heavy subject that we need to talk about. And we all need to know that God is very clear about the serious consequences for the way that we live, and specifically the way in which we use 
our bodies. He gifted them to us for a singular purpose, to bring glory and honor to him. When we don't do that, we will be judged for that, and we will incur his punishment for that. You need to know that as well. So listen to how the Apostle Paul shares God's truth with the people in the church of, of, at Corinth, whom he's trying to disciple as they learn to live out their new lives in Christ as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were, for, you were made holy, and you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My friends, the Apostle Paul is very clear that there are those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he provides a list of those sins, and many of which involve the use of our bodies, and specifically the sexual behavior that we do with our bodies. And he's very clear to say, these will not inherit the kingdom of God. We must remember as we read this passage that the Apostle Paul is speaking to the people in the church. That's y'all. That's all y'all. He is not speaking in this book to the world. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to those who say they believe in Jesus Christ and either are or are not living that out with their bodies. We need to know that. This is a message for us today. Don't listen for your neighbor. Don't listen for the world outside. You need to listen for you and how you use your body. You're going to answer for your use, as will all of us. So we must remember that this, that the Paul is speaking to the church as am I this morning. And he says this in, in, uh, in uh, verse 11. He reminds them of this. Some of you were once like that. Some of you were once like that. They, you, we. Can we make it personal and say, Lord, I was once like that too. I was once like that. Like what? Like what? Well, he tells us, you indulged in sexual sin. You worshipped idols. You committed adultery. You were male prostitutes. Or you practiced homosexuality. Or you were thieves. Or you were greedy. Or you were drunkards. Or you were abusive. Or you cheated people. He says, you were once like that. Some of you were once like that. The question then is this. What changed? What changed? changed he continues in verse 11 and he says this but you were cleansed you were made holy and you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God these people just like us were once sinners and they used their body in sinful ways but they called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ And they were cleansed from their sins. And they were made holy. And they were made right with God. God has done that for us who believe. If we trust him for these things. So, is there hope for people who are stuck in sexual sins and in sexual immorality? Is there hope for them? What's the answer? Yes! Because some of us were just like that. And Paul says, even those in his own church, he says, some of you were once like this, but you were cleansed, but you were made holy because you called in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So is there hope? Yes. If they call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask to be forgiven and cleansed. And if we were willing to be honest, some of us could say, 
I can testify to that. I was like one of those things too. But I've been cleansed. And I've been forgiven. And I've been made holy. And I no longer live like that. I use my body differently today. Some of you were once like that. That means we're not like that anymore. That means we're not to be like that anymore. Now that we have been cleansed, now that we have been made holy, now that we've been made right with God, how should we use our bodies then? Because the world tells us a lot of other things. So the Apostle Paul begins to address how we should use our bodies. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about next to them. And that's what we want to focus on today in the remainder of this passage. How then should we be using these bodies who have been cleansed, who have been made holy, who have been made right with God. We don't want to be what we were. We're this new creation. We're this new life. We've been given bodies to do something different than sexual immorality. Let's look at that together today. Let's explore the discussion that follows because the Apostle Paul is having this, the same conversation with Christians who have come out of sinful lifestyles but now need to learn how to live in obedience and how to use their bodies to glorify and honor God. We're going to take this conversation in, in three parts, and, and we're going to glean three truths about using our bodies to honor God. So let's read the next few verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. And it says this, You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and stomach for the food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us up from the dead by his power, just as he raised the Lord uh, from the dead. <clears throat> Truth number one that we need to know is this. Our bodies were made for the Lord. Our bodies were made for the Lord. You can go back to Genesis and see him make the first man and the first woman. And every body that was built, created after that, even as David said, I was knitted together in my mother's womb. womb. I, I, I was created by God. And I was given a body for a specific purpose. Our bodies were made uh, for the Lord. The world, way back in Paul's day and even now, tells us that our bodies are our own. And we can do whatever we want with them. You know what scripture says? You know what God says? Wrong. Wrong. Your body is not your own. Your body was made for the Lord. As we already talked about earlier, our bodies were created by God and given to us to fulfill the plans and purposes that he has for us. We have been each uniquely gifted with the bodies that we need to fulfill the plans that God has for us, right? And that's one of the things we like to help our kids figure out what they're gifted at doing. We love it when they go to camp and find out their giftedness and all those things, right? Because some of us, we, we are all gifted something, to do something. I was not gifted with the body of a jockey, right? Praise the Lord, right? I think, for the horse's sake at least, if nothing else, thank the Lord for that, right? Thank the Lord he ain't riding a horse. The Lord has gifted us our body specifically for the things that he has called us to accomplish that's more real than we think about. But I want you to think about it today because the way you learn to use your body is supposed to glorify the one who created you. Because your body was made for the Lord. God's plan, uh, God's plan for us has never been to allow us to do whatever we wanted. That was never part of his plan. And it certainly never included a license to sin. He didn't give you a body and say, go do whatever you want. And certainly, go and sin as much as you want. That's, that would just please me to no end, and that's what I want you to do with your body. The Lord didn't create us for that, and he never gave us a license to go and sin 
with our bodies. The Apostle Paul anticipates this pushback from the new believers who, say, who might say, I-, I thought we were forgiven of our sins, and I thought we were set free. Doesn't freedom mean that we're allowed to do anything? What's the answer? No, that's chaos. That isn't freedom. That's utter chaos. You can't just be free to do whatever you want. That will bring destruction upon you. My friends, Jesus cleansed us and set us free from our sin and made us holy so that we can freely live in a right relationship with God. That's what you've been freed to do. You've been freed from your sin. You've been freed from that bondage so you can go and live freely for God and please him and glorify him in every possible way. That's why Jesus has cleansed us. That's why he has made us holy. That's why he has made us in right relationship with God once again. Paul clearly says that our freedom doesn't include using our bodies for sexual immorality because that's not the purpose that they were created for. They were created to honor God. Look again at verse the end of verse 13 where he says this, but you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. What does our world say over and over and over again? The exact opposite of that, which is wrong. My body was made for sexual immorality. No, Paul says, no, you weren't. No, you weren't. You can't say that. You can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. The Lord cares about our bodies. The Apostle Paul actually goes even one step further, and he points out that our bodies one day are going to be raised from the dead just as the body of Jesus Christ was. That'll make you scratch your head and talk about it at Father's Day dinner, right? What? We believe in the resurrection. What's he going to raise? Your body. Your soul is already going to be with him. One day he's going to raise your body because he gave it to you as a gift. That's an amazing thing. We're not even going to dive into that very deeply today, but I want you to know that. The Apostle Paul says that our bodies are going to be raised. Look at verse 14. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. How was Jesus raised? In a bodily form. We talked about that at at, uh, Easter for sure. And then at the ascension, when Jesus ascends, he ascends with his body. One day, our body is going to be resurrected as well. There's way more to that than we have, to get, we have time to get into, but that will give you some good food to think about, and it will point this out to you, that your body is more important to God than you might have previously thought. But you need to know that our bodies were made for the Lord. What an amazing thing. What an amazing gift and what an amazing thing to understand. There is more truth to understand about our bodies, and so we need to read on this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 17 says this, Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And, and don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says, The two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Here's truth number two that we need to know, and it's this. Our bodies are actually parts of Christ. Our bodies are actually parts of Christ. We don't, we know scripture says that, but we don't give that a whole lot of deep thought, I don't think, because it doesn't often reflect in our actions. Our bodies are actually a part of Christ. Paul says, Don't you realize this? Don't you realize when you gave your life to Christ and you were baptized, you became united with him as one? Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 3 through 5, where Paul says this. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, uh, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. 
We've been united with Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ and if you've been baptized, if you've been united with Christ, you are a part of his body. Too often, even Christians think that giving our heart to Jesus is just something that we do in the spiritual realm. That that's, that's kind of separate from our body, separate from our beating. Yeah, that's my soul, that's my spirit, but that, doesn't, that just kind of affects my body. Paul says, don't you realize? Don't you realize? It affects everything. Your body becomes a part of Christ. The Apostle Paul points out that we actually become a part of Christ there in verse 15. In other uh, Bible passages, the Apostle Paul speaks of us as the body of Christ. And he references the church, but he also references us individually. We live as the body of Christ. We are his hands and feet on the earth even today. Here's an example from that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says this, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefits of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Christ is often spoken as the head. And we are always spoken of as his body. This is more than just words. This is a reality that we are living out whether we realize it or not. So if we as believers engage in sexual sin, we are using the body of Christ to fulfill those acts or to perform those acts. And Paul says for- forcefully back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that this should never happen. That this should never happen. Paul says... Um, uh, hold on, let me find my place here. Uh, should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Paul says, never. Never. This should never happen. Paul goes on to say this in verse 17. Why should this not happen? Because the person is joined to the Lord and is one in spirit with him. We've been joined to the Lord and we are one in spirit with him. What does that mean? Well, it means in part this, that we are joined to doing the will of God and honoring him in every way with including our physical bodies. We are to do that in our physical bodies. We are one with Christ. We are, we are united with him. We are saying, Christ, your purposes in this world are my purposes. And God's purpose is to fill, fulfill the will of the Father and to do it for his glory and for his honor. And when we are believers and we are baptized, we're saying, Jesus, I'm doing the same thing. I'm united with you. And I'm going to do what you would have me to do with my body, to glorify and honor you. My friends, you need to know it's an honor. It's an honor to be a part of the body of Christ. And it, we must use our bodies to honor him. We are his hands and feet here. We are the people that represent him to others in our church, in our homes, in our communities. We represent Christ. It's an amazing honor to do that. It isn't a punishment. We act like we're being punished because we can't live like the world. Do you see what living like the world gets you? Death, destruction, all those things. Jesus says we're one. Use your body to honor the Father. Use your body to carry out his plans and his purposes for you. And you'll find untold blessing and fulfillment that you never knew existed. Because your body is actually now part of the body of Christ. What an amazing thing. What an amazing honor that he would let us do that. Have you seen yourself in the mirror? I mean, seriously. Your body gets to be a part of the body of Christ. I wouldn't vote for me to be a, body, a part of that body, would you? Don't ask me that question. Vote for yourself. God values our bodies, and he gave them to us. He's not ashamed of them, and he wants us to be a part of his body. That's deeper and more powerful and more honoring than we could ever probably fully comprehend. But I want you to begin to think about that today. 
there's more truth about our bodies that we need to understand, so let's read on. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20 says this, Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for you were bought with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Truth number three we need to know is this. Our bodies must, must be used to honor God. God. Our bodies must be used to honor God. This portion of scripture reveals why the devil fights so hard to get us into sexual sin with our bodies and why it's so prevalent in our society. This, these verses tell us why if we'll listen to what they say. Um, this portion of scripture says this. Paul says, for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Sexual sin destroys our own body and it damages the temple of the Holy Spirit at the same time. It's a two for one win for the evil one if he can get us into sexual sin. He not only destroys our life, he tears down the body of Christ and he tears down the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a two for one win. If you were a betting man, you would bet on two-for-one odds, wouldn't you? Like, ah, that sounds like a good deal. Why do you think the devil doubles down on sexual immorality in our, in our nation, in the world, all those things? It's a two-for-one win for him when he gets us to enter into that sexual immorality. And Paul tells us, flee. Flee from it. Don't play with it. Don't see how close you can get. Don't see where the line is. Don't do any of those things. Flee from it. Paul says, run from sexual immorality. And we must understand that when we are doing that, we are preserving our own lives and we are preserving the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us, who has been gifted to us. And it's a double win for us. We win because our lives are not utterly destroyed. We win because we maintain the temple of the Holy Spirit, the body which God has given to us. And we bring a double blessing on ourselves when we will do that. You need to know that. We are preserving our own lives, and we are preserving the temple of the Holy Spirit. And throughout this entire chapter, Paul says over and over again, don't you realize, don't you realize, and the truth is this, many of us don't realize, do we? I encourage you, go back this week and read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and read all those don't realize statements again, and see if you realized or if you didn't. The truth is many of us don't realize because we haven't stopped to listen to what God's word says about our bodies. But we're bombarded with what the world says about them. We will never realize until we stop and say, God, what do you say about my body? Why did you gift it to me? How can I use it to glorify and honor you? My friends, we need to realize that your body does not belong to you. It was bought at a very high price. God bought you with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and he redeemed you, all of you, not just your soul, not just your spirit, not just your mind, not just your right hand or your left hand. He redeemed your body, too, all of it. He desires it and designed it to be used to glorify him in every way. God bought us with a high price and he redeemed us from the bondage of sin and death. And Jesus set us free so that we can use every aspect of our lives to bring glory and honor to God. He gave us this new life so we can honor God with our bodies, so we can learn to do that to the fullest extent so we can experience the satisfaction and the delight in doing what pleases and honors the Lord in every way. So you have a choice today. How are you going to use your body? It's already been gifted to you. 
it's already been outfitted by him to fulfill the calling that he has given you and to fulfill the desires that he has given you. He has already gifted it to you. Are you using it to fulfill those purposes for which he has gifted it to you for? To honor him, to glorify him, to demonstrate to others that our bodies are not ours, that they belong to him. And he paid a very high price for that. See, the only way that we can do this is by first calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what verse 11 told us. How do we live different? It isn't that we tried harder. It isn't that we followed a specific political party or an agenda or any of those other things. How did we get from what we once were to what he designed us to be? It says, by first calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And when we call on him, he cleanses us and he makes us holy and he makes us right with God. That's how we get transferred from what we used to be to what he created us to be. And then we begin to learn to use our bodies to honor and glorify him in every way. Uh, Friends, if you haven't done that, that's the place to start. It's not a list of rules. It's not a list of things you should or shouldn't do with your body. It's by first saying, I'm calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that he is my Lord and Savior and that he saved all of me. He saved my body. He saved my soul. He saved everything. If you haven't done that, that's the place to start. My friends, if you are still stuck in a sexual sin, that's also the place to start. By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come in and to forgive and to cleanse you. And some of us can testify, he'll do it. He'll do it. Just like Paul says, some of you were once like that. Some of us were once like that. But we called on the name of the Lord and we were forgiven and cleansed. Our lives testify that that's a reality that you can live into as well. But it starts by saying, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, cleanse me. Jesus, make me holy. Because I want to live right for God with my body. And the way I fulfill all the desires that he gives me. Christians, when we're tempted to give in to sexual sin, you need to remember Paul's command. Run from it. Run from it. Flee from it. The devil's trying to get a double score on you. And you want to double score back on him and say, no, no, uh uh-uh. You're not getting a double off of me. I'm going to get a double for the Lord. I'm going to run and I'm going to preserve the life and the body that you've given me. I'm going to preserve the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you've put in me, so I can live to glorify and honor you. By doing so, we preserve our own body and our own lives. And we preserve the blessings that God wants to give us when we live our lives and use our bodies to glorify him. There is blessing and fulfillment that you'll never find anywhere else. We preserve the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is designed to bring glory glory and honor to God. And he'll bless us for that. And he'll honor us for that as well. My friends, God has designed our bodies for something far greater and longer lasting than the empty and brokenness of sexual immorality. Scripture says sin is fun for a season. And then what happens? Brokenness and emptiness. Many of us can testify that's exactly what you find when you pursue sexual immorality. God created us for something way, way better for that. God has designed our bodies to honor him and to bring blessings both now and on the day when he raises our bodies from the dead. And we are honored and we are rewarded for the way that we used our bodies to honor and glorify God. So my friends, how are you going to use your bodies? What do you need to do this morning as you call or as we respond to God's call to use our bodies to glorify him? If you need to ask him, Lord, forgive me. Lord, cleanse me. Then you do that. If you need to ask him, Lord, help me to keep running because the devil is pursuing. You ask the Lord to give you wisdom, to use your eyes to see and your ears to hear when the temptations are coming. And then say, Lord, help me to use my feet to run, to run. You gave me feet to move forward. And I don't want to move into the trap of sexual immorality. I want to stay free. 
free to use my life to glorify and honor you. Would you ask him today for whatever you need? He's a good father, and he'll meet our needs today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of our bodies. Father, if we're honest, we don't give it a whole lot of thought. And when we do, we often think in the negative sense of all the bad things that we shouldn't do, but we want to do, and all those things. Father, forgive us for that. Help us to focus on the gift that they have been, that they are gifted to us. That we could do this world and experience all the blessings that you have for us. Father, thank you for the gift of our bodies. Help us to learn to use them to glorify and honor you in every possible way. And Lord, keep us from sexual sin. Keep us from sexual immorality, which this world pushes as normal and as acceptable. Father, you've already told us it is not normal and it is not acceptable. That is not what you created our bodies for. Father, thank you that you created our bodies to bring glory and honor to yourself. Thank you that you created each of us unique and gifted us with specific talents and purposes and looks that we might bring glory and honor to you in different ways. And yet, Lord, all pointing back to you of your great and awesome gift to us, this new life that is meant to be lived for your glory and for your honor in every way. Father, hear our prayers today. You've told us if we would call out on the name of Jesus Christ that we could be forgiven, that we could be cleansed, that we could be made holy, that you would send your Holy Spirit to indwell us. Father, hear the prayers of those today who are calling out on you and asking, Father, forgive me. Send your Holy Spirit in my life. Cleanse me once again and make me whole that I might live completely for the honor and glory of God. Father, hear our prayers and do that cleansing work that only you can do. Lord, make us holy by your Holy Spirit and give us the empowerment we need to continue to use our bodies to glorify and honor you. Father, for those of us, all of us, who struggle with temptations to sin, whether it be sexual or otherwise, Father, you have given us the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the discernment of the Holy Spirit to know when those temptations are coming and to respond in a way that would honor and glorify you. Thank you that we no longer have to give in to those sins. We've been set free and we've been empowered to run. We've been empowered to, to speak truth to lies. Father, give us those words. Give us those insights. Lord, give us the ability to, to flee from sin and to call on your name and to experience your power and your presence as we want to live for you and preserve our bodies and preserve the temple of the Holy Spirit. Father, give us that power. Give us that insight. Give us that wisdom to turn and to run from those things that would want to destroy us and our families and our city and our nation. Father, you have called us to something greater. You have gifted us the ability to something greater. Help us to live those new lives out for your glory and for your honor, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as I give you the benediction this morning? It's the same benediction that we've been using. I hope you're not tired of it. Because God's not done doing it in us. It's not just fancy God words. It's who he is and what he wants to do with us. Listen for what he wants to do. It includes our body. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. Go and use your body to glorify and honor God this week. You are dismissed.